Did we do it? We're live. No problems. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Happy Wednesday. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Are we live? <laughs> I'm hoping we don't have any issues like we had last Wednesday. So excited that you're all joining me. I think that sound is hopefully working and video is working and I'm so excited. If you're catching me on the replay on YouTube, please know you can use the chapters that I have below to jump ahead, to skip all the intros and all the things if you want to just get right into the meat and potatoes. As always, if you have other things going on, pop us up on the YouTube app, plug in your headphones, cook your dinner, clean up your workout space that some of you did last week, hit the gym, uh, drive home, whatever you got to do, and just be a part of the convo in whatever ways that you can. And of course, as always, as we do every single Wednesday, just be sure to stick around to the end of the broadcast where we have a little real-time Q&A, a little mini coaching session. As always, all of these weekly live broadcasts are saved for you in a playlist here on my YouTube, and most are also released as podcast episodes the following week. Please don't forget, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel, like this video, leave a little comment on the main video post, and as always, it helps me a ton if you share my content with anyone else who you think might benefit from it. Uh, all of this really helps the health, <laughs> pun intended, of my YouTube channel, which has taken a little bit of a beating over the last few years, taking a little bit of a break, shifting from cooking and recipes to talking all about nutrition, health habits, fitness, and all the things that we're talking about here. Yeah, definitely an old folks chat, meat and potatoes, all of that good stuff. If you're new here, my name is Beth. I am a certified functional nutritionist. I'm certified in nutritional psychology. I am a 500 hour yoga instructor a mindfulness coach, and I'm currently completing my CPT with the National Academy for Sports Medicine. And I help all of my clients and hopefully all of you navigate mindset and behavior changes with compassion, grace, and ease. So welcome to my weekly series, Balanced Wellness Wednesdays with Beth, where we just get a chance to connect and chat and learn and grow and dig into all things nutrition, fitness, mindset, mindfulness, habit change. And every single week, we have a different topic that we get to dive into together. And you'll have space to share and ask questions. So tonight is a conversation. If you saw the thumbnail, if you saw the title, this is a conversation where we're going to talk a little bit about body changes and changes in your weight, specifically that happen after we turn 40, that magical times, uh, the magical time in our life that so many of us are navigating there will definitely be discussions of female hormone shifts, uh, but plenty of the discussions tonight are not specific to individuals with female hormones. So my folks with male hormones, hang in there. There's also plenty for you to take away from tonight's conversation and discussion. Question for all of you as I'm diving into this intro, and maybe those of you who were here last week or caught the replay can share in the YouTube live chat. I'd love to hear if you've started anything new after last week's discussion where we were talking all about getting started and just doing one small something and navigating first steps, especially if you're feeling overwhelmed. I'd love to hear if any of you, I told you I was going to check back in with you. I'd love to hear if anybody started something new in the last week. I will share with you, if you don't get my email newsletter, you might have missed where I shared. And this is spectacular considering the conversation we had, I think, two weeks ago. I decided to start running. Something I said, I can't do. I suck at. It hurts me too much. I'll never be able to do it. I started to realize not just on the discussions we were having here, but in some conversations I've had with some friends who just recently started running and were making excuses that they could never be a runner because their times sucked and they weren't doing long distance running. And I said, well, if you're running, you're a runner and it doesn't have to look any one way. And then I kind of realized that I was the one that needed to hear that message. And I was definitely kind of calling myself out and realizing I was holding a bit of a fixed mindset. So I don't know when it was, maybe a week and a half ago, I just said, run. Like, what's the worst thing that happens? Maybe it sucks as bad as you think it does. And you remember, and maybe it's not as bad. Worst case, I uh, realize that it's not for me and I continue doing all the things I'm doing. Best case, I learned that there's a way I can implement it into my daily habits and routines and uh, the latter happened and I've been able to just do little running intervals as part of my 
morning walks and nobody's breaking any world records over here, but it feels really good to know that my body can do that, even if it's in a way that is not perfect or what would be, you know, labeled as a <laughs> a runner in some circle. So I'd love to hear if anybody started anything new in the last few weeks. As I mentioned, today's live broadcast, we're going to dive deep into the topic. Uh, I think that resonates with so many of us, the changes our bodies tend to undergo after the age of 40. And I want to start with something right out of the gate that I think is really important. Let me pull up my slides. <laughs> Uh, something that I think is really important, especially in a discussion that requires a whole lot of nuance, especially in a discussion about bodies um, and body changes, and that is that bodies change. <laughs> and so while we're talking about how are the ways that our bodies change over 40, what are the things that we can do to navigate that and potentially change that if it's something that we desire, I think it's really incredibly important to understand that bodies change that it's a natural part of life's evolution, and we are not, none of us are meant to stay the same. And even still, even with that information, I think those of you who are on the call or catching the replay, who are over 40 can very much resonate with this, even still, it's not uncommon to just kind of feel like, <laughs> to feel like a little bit of a stranger in your own skin as you navigate these changes. So today we're going to sh shed a little light on why some of these changes happen and how you can better support your body during this transformative phase. And again, one thing I want to get straight right out of the gate is that if you are actively trying and sort of your life's mission over 40 is to try to recapture your high school body weight or some pre-baby physique, that may not serve your your well-being anymore. And our bodies are meant to evolve and that's the beautiful thing. And I think it can be a really wonderful journey of like joy and growth and embracing these new chapters as life unfolds without just this kind of like hatred and disdain. I also want to take a moment in this conversation and all of the nuance that it requires to emphasize that as a practitioner, I don't inherently believe that weight gain is a bad thing or that losing weight or experiencing fat loss is always inherently good. I think, and I recognize and honor that every, not every individual wants to lose fat or experience weight loss. And I just, I wholeheartedly, a lot of you have heard me talk about this here on this channel many times. I wholeheartedly believe in bodily autonomy. Only you know what is right for you and only you know what is aligned with your core values. And this includes whether or not body composition is something that your body composition is something you'd like to change. And if it is something you'd like to change, that's cool. And I respect that. And I want to help you do it in a really compassionate and kind way. And if you don't, that is also super cool too. <laughs> so if you're kind of looking to get some clarity on why your body is changing and how you can adapt with some grace and compassion and kindness, but most importantly, knowledge, you're in the right place. And we're not just talking about weight gain tonight. Obviously, that's a big part of it. And I would say usually that's the number one thing I hear from people that they're struggling with. I don't know for those of you maybe joining me on the live, if you can share with your body changes that you're navigating over 40, like what is the prominent, most sort of dominant thing you're experiencing that's making it challenging for you? Um, we're also going to dive into this bigger picture, kind of exploring the loss of lean muscle, hormonal shifts that happen, again, not just with female hormones, reduced energy expenditure, insulin resistance, hunger and fullness signaling, um, and just our the powerful impact of our mindset. So as we dive into kind of the six big, big reasons that I see people experience these body changes, I will be sharing and weaving in and out of the conversation, these practical solutions that hopefully you can begin to apply to your life. We'll touch on some nutritional considerations. We'll touch on stress management and of course, other lifestyle factors like sleep, embracing physical activity and nurturing mindfulness. So Let's dive in to the top six things. And just a reminder, this is just the beginning. All of the coaching programs that I offer and all of the one-on-one -on -one coaching I um, offer to folks, they're designed to offer you much deeper insights and personal guidance. This is intended to scratch the surface. And this is exactly what we're doing in the upcoming round of Trust and Thrive Academy, Thriving Beyond 40. It is my signature full immersion eight eight week small group coaching program. I'll be telling you more about that later. Uh, we kick things off September 26th, 
Early enrollment for my waitlist folks has already opened and they're getting some really cool, amazing bonuses. And then the door is officially open for enrollment if you're not on the waitlist September 6th, which is next week already. So let's dive in to uh, what I got for you tonight. So as we journey into this kind of idea of the body changes we experience after 40, this I think is going to sort of, I don't know, hit you in a way that maybe you're not ready for <laughs> this first initial thought. And just maybe it, it might bust some myths or some things that you've previously heard. It is really important for me to communicate this. Our metabolisms are incredibly adaptable. That's what they do. They adjust, they recalibrate, but they do not break and they don't need to, we don't need to fix our metabolism. This adaptability of our metabolism is at the core of how our body responds to stimuli, or as you're going to learn tonight, sometimes the lack thereof, the stimuli that we present and provide it in our lives. So here's what's most important is that the law the laws, excuse me, of thermodynamics, calories in, calories out, how our metabolism functions, those do not change regardless of our age. And while it might feel like things that worked before no longer do, and there are reasons for that and we will talk about it, our bodies don't start suddenly functioning in some new way. So the concept of energy balance still remains. Here's where it gets fascinating, though. This, as Shoshona kind of led, <laughs> the Shoshona shared hormones suck. <laughs> they do suck at times, but they're also amazing and beautiful. And they're what gives us our vibrancy and our life. And there are ways that we can support more balanced hormones as we age. So these factors that can influence our unique physiology and how that energy balance occurs can and definitely do evolve over time. And that's what can make this aging stuff so incredibly frustrated, frustrating. So this is not, you know, this is where we want to, I should say, hone in on the things we have control over and let go of the things that we cannot. We cannot change that we're 40 years old or 50 years old or 60 years old, but we can change how our body responds to that, how stress resilient we are. Um, and hormones, which you're going to learn a lot about tonight, how these powerful messengers within us can undoubtedly play a role in, in shaping some of these changes, as can significant changes in our energy expenditure. So number one, the number one thing on this list, why our bodies change over 40, is loss of lean mass. And this drastically impacts our body weight and our physique. So this is a pivotal factor. I think most people think that they want weight loss when what they actually want is fat loss. Because if you experience significant muscle loss, you're setting yourself up for a long list of really serious problems. And I don't know how many of you have ever heard this term before, and maybe you've heard it from me here on broadcasts in the past. Sarcopenia is, um, sarcopenia is a, a term that, that describes the natural age-related or age-associated muscle loss that all experience, all adults will experience. As we hit our 30s and beyond, there's a natural process that begins. Our bodies start to lose muscle mass. I don't know if that's something that is a new concept for you or if it's something you've heard before, but every passing decade, we say goodbye to a portion of our hard-earned muscle. So I want to talk about numbers really quickly. After the age of 30, Women who lead sedentary lives can lose approximately 3 to 8% of their muscle mass annually. And that range isn't fixed, it's an average, and it is influenced a bit by age, where, of course, younger women experience slower rates, older women face faster rates of muscle loss. But here's where things get really intriguing. The rate of that muscle loss increases as menopause arrives. So that uptick is closely tied to the decline in estrogen levels during this phase of life. And again, for those of you on the call who have male hormones, there is some muscle loss happening for you as well. It just may not be as advanced as those with female um, reproductive hormones. So age-related muscle loss happens independently of those hormones. 
again, as I touched on, even if you're a male or if you contain or you have male hormones, you're going to experience this loss. Yet the reduction of estrogen and testosterone contributes to further loss. So all of this in the context of your body, this can impact your body's ability to maintain a healthy body weight for you. And here's the bigger thing is that a lot of people use the term toned, like they're seeking this toned appearance. You will not get a toned body appearance if you are consistently losing lean muscle mass. So when perimenopause and menopause set in, there's a natural decline in our hormones and those play crucial ro roles in preserving our muscle mass. And in those hormone levels dipping, the potential for muscle mass reduction increases and it impacts your metabolic rate. Here is the silver lining. Regardless of the hormones that you contain, what age you are, the good news is, is that it is possible for absolutely anyone over the age of 40, including those who are menopausal and postmenopausal or in perimenopause, to build muscle. It might be a little bit more challenging than before, but you can absolutely do it. And the most important thing you cannot overlook here is the crucial role of your nutrition to preserve your lean muscle, to maintain a healthy body weight for you and supporting muscle gains, if that's something that you want to do beyond just maintaining or preserving, this all goes hand in hand with eating right. So this includes ensuring that you are consuming something we've talked about here at length, adequate amounts of protein daily. You have to avoid extreme dieting or under eating. All of these further accelerate the loss of mean lean muscle. And this is a topic I cover in depth in all of my programs, including my self-guided program, Empowered Nourishment, and Trust and Thrive Academy, my group coaching program. We discuss protein consumption, how much for you, various sources and which ones to consider, and how you can preserve your lean muscle. You can actively reduce your risk of sarcopenia, this muscle loss, as well as osteopenia and osteoporosis, again, regardless of age, regardless of hormones, through regular strength training. This is why I'm a ginormous proponent for strength training. I strongly recommend everyone listening to this incorporate strength training and weight-bearing exercises into your fitness plans. Ideally, we're engaging in progressive overload program, um, a progressive overload strength training program like two to three times a week. If it's new, start with one and build. It not only benefits our metabolic health and our, our mobility and our agility, but it supports our immune health, our mental and emotional well-being, and it protects our bones and our joints very important as we age. So all of these can also help to improve joint pain. That was one of the questions that came in. So I don't currently offer personalized programming, uh, but I do as a coach kind of function as a concierge of, of sorts. I assist my clients in finding the strength training programs that best suit their needs and their fitness level and even their accessibility to equipment. And actually as part of this upcoming special launch of the Trust and Thrive Academy, Everyone who joins will be offered a discounted access to an incredible progressive overload strength training program. It's actually the one I follow myself, and it'll be designed for you to follow alongside your eight weeks in the group. So if that pro program isn't a good fit, I do help you to select something that will align best for you, your needs, and your limitations. Um, JBX said, so is weight training more important than running at this age? I love how you asked that because I wouldn't say one is more important than the other. They both provide different things. I would say cardio and aerobic exercise should also be a part of your training as well as strength training. Um, they, they're both, they, they serve different purposes, um, incredible benefits of both. I would say if you're trying to pick one or the other, then make time for a short amount of strength and resistance and weight bearing exercises every week and some amount of time dedicated, like figure out one of the things I do in my group coaching programs is I have my clients kind of fill out a timeline of what their days look like and what kind of time they have available and maybe split it up. And whether it's 60, 40, 70, 30, 50, 50 cardio and strength training, that's ideal. I would say whatever you're going to do to get your body moving out of the gate, jazzercise, as Shoshona said, I love that. <laughs> I would say whatever's going to get you moving first, do, and then whatever you can do to be doing both, I would be doing both. Um, yeah, I know that's not the answer you want to hear. I know you want to have, you want to hear me say to pick one and it's, this is the way, uh, but ideally we are doing both and one isn't more important. It's just, you know, for, I would say for body composition, I guess, to put it in the context of tonight's conversation, Jeremy, 
for in the context of body composition, you're probably going to get a bit more bang for your buck with strength training than than running, for example, because if you're not strength training in in addition to running, you're just going to have a further loss of that lean muscle, uh, especially as we age and especially without eating in a way to support it and kind of progressive overload strength training. Um, body composition wise, you tend to benefit more when strength training is kind of prominent. Um, so in that way, if I had to pick one, for sure, I would pick strength training, but we should still be doing some cardio and it doesn't have to be running. It's whatever you enjoy that provides, um, you know, an aerobic, uh, cardiovascular, uh, challenge for your body. You're welcome. Number two, I think this goes without saying, and it's probably the one that most of you assumed we were going to talk about. And again, we're going to talk a bit about female related hormones, but again, if, if my dudes with uh, male hormones hang in there, we're going to, we're going to also talk about how this impacts you, but I want to dive into the inter, wow, I want to dive into the intricate world of hormonal shifts. Um, I think this is really important for us to just have a baseline as we're going to kind of scratch the surface here, a baseline understanding of what is happening to our hormones. I think this becomes paramount to us feeling informed and, and uh, informed about what is changing with our body. And most importantly, kind of eliminating a lot of the confusion instead of feeling like a victim of our circumstances, right? Like, oh, well, hormones. Uh, so first again, I'm going to kind of bust some myths for you all tonight. I want to address a really common misconception, and that is menopause-related hormonal changes may not be the primary driver of weight gain, at least to the level that many people might think. So I'll explain further, but it, a lot of the research, and I'm going to put some links in the show notes after, after the broadcast, but research suggests that men and women gain fat at roughly the same rate in their 40s and 50s. Um, and so as you'll learn in just a moment, these hormones actually play an inf influential role, but most often the role that they're playing is shifting in how body fat is distributed throughout our body and how our energy levels change. And these can tend to lead to desires and motivations dropping. Um, and most often it's our changing movement patterns that are correlated with aging versus the aging or the hormones themselves that are contributing to significant weight gain. Lots of nuance here, but I think one of the things you're going to hear me talk about tonight is that a lot of the things we've often assumed have been proven wrong through recent research and recent data. And that doesn't mean we should throw the towel in and go, well, I don't understand what's wrong with me then. I think it gives us an opportunity to realize that we probably have a lot more control than we realize. So I want to just loosely dive into some of the ways our hormones are changing, starting with individuals with female reproductive hormones. And probably the one that takes center stage most frequently is estrogen. Its influence reverberates through our entire bodies. Estrogen affects where we store fat. It can play a role in regulating our metabolism and signaling and infecting, affecting our hunger. When we have lower estrogen levels, which happens as we move through perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause, a shift towards abdominal fat distribution can occur. We also experience muscle weakness and decreased muscle mass, as we just talked about. Those can be felt. Those presence, the presence of those can be felt. So Estrogen's decline is also contributing or can contribute to insulin resistance and inflammation, even things like um, muscle protein synthesis. Because of all of this, it tends to influence our fat distribution and a bit of our metabolic processes as well as our hunger. And these all kind of together impact our body composition. Brain explosion emoji from Shoshona. So here's the thing. These consequences of low estrogen also extend a little bit further because estrogen plays an important, it's a very vital player in our bone health. And so the reduction of estrogen as we age escalates the risk of bone density loss. This can lead to things like osteopenia, uh, osteoporosis, and things like fractures. So this is why strength training is so important, especially as we age, especially as women. This is why maintaining lean mass is so important because that protects the, the, the integrity and the health of our joints and our bones and all of these things that get weaker and weaker as we age. 
And now I want to extend the, the conversation a bit or this discussion beyond estrogen because it gets all of the attention. But again, those with female hormones, we're also experiencing a decline of progesterone and testosterone as we age. And pro progesterone's reduction during perimenopause and then later in menopause, this impacts things like our sleep and our moods. How many of you here have had one night, even if you're not early perimenopause or menopause, or you even have female uh, hormones, who has had a shitty night of sleep that leads to extreme hunger, elevated cravings, feeling like you want to eat all the quote unquote fun foods or the quote unquote bad foods, right? Dis disturbed sleep leads to blood sugar swings. It can lead to insulin resistance and it can increase our cravings. All of these can impact our, our body weight and our body composition. So this underlines this need for revising some dietary and exercise strategies because not so much of the hormones, but some of the things that are a result of those, those hormones. And again, bone density loss and shifts in our moods um, can also be a, a part of this hormones tale. And then lastly, testosterone, which I think is often thought of exclusively as a, a, a male hormone, it is present in all bodies, and it also undergoes a decrease as estrogen and progesterone wane. And this imbalance influences our muscle mass, again, it, in, in, it affects our bone density, our body fat distribution, and our mood regulation. So again, all of these could lead to us making different choices, ex expecting or, or wanting or craving different foods, moving our bodies less. Reduced testosterone can lead to a rise in body fat, especially around the abdominal area, and this can also lead to low motivation and low drive. For those of you with male hormones, aging can bring its own set of hor uh, uh, changes, excuse me, Lower testosterone, obviously the things that we just talked about re uh, relate to your body as well. And for those uh, possibly dealing with some blood sugar dysregulation, you may be struggling with higher estrogen. Um, so from something called aromatization, and this is from glucose and blood glucose dysregulation. And this can lead to body fat accumulation often in the midsection. So again, these hormones become dysregulated as a result of aging, and then a lot of it impacts the choices we're making with our nutrition, the choices that we're making with our food, how we're sleeping, our stress, resiliency. So navigating this stuff doesn't have to be this kind of like scary sort of mystery. Again, I know it's kind of reiterating the same points you often hear from me, but when we build a strong nutritional foundation, this is key. I tell everybody I work with, if you do not manage and balance your blood sugar, you will never, ever have balanced and, and um, even sort of uh, hormones, whatever stage of life you're in. So balancing blood sugar and managing blood sugar, supporting your digestion so that you can properly absorb the nutrients and use those nutrients that become cofactors for hormone production. So while hormones may be lower as a result of aging and changing of seasons, they don't have to be sort of flatlined, right? And so we want to mitigate that as best we can. All of these things are things that we have control over. And again, this is where within the programs I've created, I guide you through these important factors, building a nutrition plan that's personalized to you to help you manage and balance your blood sugar, to support your digestion, both Empowered Nourishment and the Trust and Thrive Academy. They're designed to equip you with the knowledge and the tools to navigate these crucial foundations so that you can maintain balance in the face of hormonal changes that are going to happen. And one of the things I want to share just at this point before I move on, I think hormones is probably the biggest section on this call and the rest kind of shorten significantly. So I promise they're not all going to be this long, but I think this is the one there's the most confusion and the most myths. Um, a lot of times people ask me, how can I naturally balance my hormones? And you may not realize this, but it's actually a very broad question. We have so many hormones in our body, not just reproductive hormones. We're going to talk about some of those in a moment. And not everybody experiences the same imbalances. So expecting your hormones to be balanced, as I said, when your blood sugar is a wreck, when your stress is high, when you aren't sleeping, when your digestion is a mess, it's not going to happen. So this is why I always encourage folks to tackle the foundations first, 
make sure you get those ducks in a row. And this is when I may consider with clients to uh, bring in deeper hormone testing, like the Dutch test or something that allows us to kind of look at what are our hormones doing over the cycle of a month. Um, and again, if you decide to do Trust and Thrive Academy this round where we're doing this Thriving Beyond 40 edition, um, you do have the option to add on uh, hormone testing as you get deep into the program and as you're working on those nutritional foundations and kind of building from there. So let's move on to number three, insulin resistance and poor insulin sensitivity. Huge impact on our body, our body weight, and how our, how our body feels, our energy levels. I know, uh, Shoshona, you shared your energy is crappy. This is directly related to our blood sugar. So insulin, as I said, we have other hormones that aren't reproductive hormones. Insulin is a hormone of blood sugar, and it plays a absolutely pivotal role in regulating blood sugar levels. And it becomes, or it can become, it doesn't have to, but it can become less effective over time. And this phenomenon known as insulin resistance is characterized by your cells. It's kind of like the boy who cried wolf, essentially. Your cells no longer response, respond adequately to the signaling from insulin. So the outcome, you have elevated blood sugar levels, and then this leads to a cascade of effects on our health. Insulin resistance often intensifies with age, and this can contribute to changes in our body composition. It is not uncommon for individuals over 40 to experience a decrease in their insulin sensitivity, which means their bodies require more and more insulin to manage blood sugar levels effectively. This in turn leads to, or can lead to, higher levels of circulating insulin, a hormone that when it's left chronically elevated, will and can promote fat storage particularly, again, you're going to hear this a few times tonight, particularly around the abdominal area. So we have to address the unique interactions that can occur as we age that will increase the likelihood of insulin resistance. And a lot of these we've already touched on. Number one is muscle mass. Because of that natural loss of muscle mass, sarcopenia, your muscle tissue is a major site for glucose uptake and reduced muscle mass can lead to decreased insulin sensitivity. So if you are struggling with blood sugar dysregulation, insulin resistance, um, if you're showing any of the signs kind of pre-diabetic or diabetic, you have to be building muscle. You are going to do your body a world of favors. Just general cellular changes that happen as we age impact the functioning of our cells. And this can decrease in the ability of our cells to respond to those signals. Again, that, that sort of insulin resistance. Three, inflammation. Chronic low-grade inflammation, which tends to increase with age, can interfere with insulin uh, signaling and contribute to insulin resistance. Our body fat distribution. So changes in our body fat composition, which can come from a whole variety of factors, can, uh, especially if it's an increase in our visceral fat, this is the fat around our internal organs, this can also lead to insulin resistance. And visceral fat is associated with a greater metabolic risk. Hormone changes, hormonal changes, we've talked about this a lot already. These changes in our hormones that can occur or do occur with aging can impact our insulin sensitivity. So this is where I said it's not so much our hormones that are directly impacting our body. It's all of these sort of resulting factors that if we're not, we're not dealing with the foundations of our nutrition and our lifestyle will lead to these things, less so uh, the hormones themselves. When we have a decline in estrogen levels, especially during menopause, this can affect our insulin sensitivity as well as the balance between progesterone and estrogen. They can also affect our blood sugar levels. So we can have something called estrogen, relative estrogen dominance. I'm getting kind of into the weeds here. Physical activity is kind of the last one here. Um, when we have reduced physical activity, when we are not moving our bodies, when we are pretty sedentary, especially as we age, which we tend to do as a culture, this can contribute to insulin resistance. One of the best things you can do to improve sense insulin sensitivity is to exercise regularly. Again, the great news, as overwhelming as a lot of this can feel, the great news is the lifestyle choices you make play the most significant role in managing insulin resistance, regardless of your age. Regular physical activity, balanced nutrition, and maintaining that lean muscle mass all of these contribute to improving your insulin sensitivity, getting in fiber-rich foods, 
prioritizing complex carbs, including healthy fats and lean proteins at all of your meals, these stabilize your blood sugar levels. This is everything that I teach inside of my programs, how to do that, how much. Stress management is huge and crucial for blood sugar. So if you're not making space for uh, incorporating stress management uh, strategies in your life, chronic stress can contribute to insulin re resistance. Um, so adding in mindfulness or meditation, adequate sleep, so I think the most important takeaway for this point is just understanding the role that insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity can, can make in your body composition. And again, inside of Empowered Nourishment, my self-guided program, as well as the Trust and Thrive Academy, we have an entire module inside of Trust and Thrive Academy. It's entire week where we talk only exclusively about blood sugar management, insulin sensitivity. I equip you with a toolbox of strategies to manage your blood sugar levels, to foster insulin sensitivity, and just ultimately to optimize your body's response to the food that you eat. All right, so number four, reasons why you might be struggling with your body and weight changes over 40. This is another one that, again, I think it's going to change your perspective a little bit, and I might, uh, I might bust a few myths. <laughs> we already kind of touched on this bit uh, a little, but reduced energy expenditure. You might notice that I did not say, and I haven't really said at all this evening, slowed metabolism. And that is this common idea that our metabolism slows down as we age. There's this long-held belief that we experience significant metabolism slow down once we hit 40. And as much as I hate to burst everyone's bubble who has used that excuse, quote unquote, the truth is, is these changes are much more related to reduced energy expenditure. So what does that even mean? If you're like, what are the differences? What do these words mean? If you feel like your metabolism is hitting the brakes as you age, the reality is it's not quite as straightforward as age or hormones kind of dictating this slow metabolism. Hormones like estrogen can play a role in impacting our resting metabolic rate. This is the kind of primary contributor to this change. Um, but this, the biggest thing that impacts our resting metabolic rate and our metabolic function has been shown to be related more to something entirely different than age or hormones, and that is your activity levels. So I think it was maybe in 2021, some new research came out where they showed our metabolism doesn't slow down as much as we once thought when we hit this certain age. It does decline a bit, but it's typically, and I want you to hear these numbers because it's going to kind of blow your mind a little. It's typically only about one to 2% every decade after the age of 20. So this decline in our basal metabolic rate by around one to 2% per decade after the age of 20 translates in a reduction in calories that we're burning at rest. That's our basal metabolic rate. This decline would only mean a decrease of approximately 20 to 40 calories less per day every decade of life that you're burning. Now, I'm not saying that that's not changing even faster for other reasons. I'm telling you due to age, what the research shows is aging only contributes to that loss of metabolism of only about one to 2%. That's it. So it's actually relatively small. And so this is what's highlighting important factors like physical activity and muscle mass in influencing our overall calorie expenditure. So modest, right? Very modest compared to muscle mass and hormonal shifts. It is mind blowing, isn't it? Hi, Annie, how nice to see you here. <laughs> so most important, most significant aspect at play here is our activity level. As we age, I can look back at things I was doing in my 20s and 30s versus now in my 40s. As we age, we just move less. And this is both planned exercise as well as non-exercise activity. Think about in your 20s when you're in college and you're going here and here and parties and going and running these errands. And like, you do not sit still in your 20s. You do not sit still. Most of that is that non-exercise activity, which makes up the a good chunk of your daily metabolic functioning, your, your total daily energy expense. Expenditure. This is things like in your day-to-day -day now, walking, household chores, gardening, taking the dogs out and moving about, other non-exercise movements. This reduction in our overall activity contributes much more significantly to this feeling of slowed metabolism than we give it credit for. 
So it's important that you just embrace a lifestyle that encourages, as I started saying earlier, just that encourages movement of any kind. Just move your body as much as you can. If you're feeling like you're struggling in these ways, incorporate both structured planned exercise as well as just daily movement. All of this can make a considerable difference. Engage in activities that build muscle and promote bone health, such as strength training. Um, It's going to help your metabolism to function more optimally. You may not realize this. I think this is something, again, to kind of push up against commonly belief, uh, common beliefs that we have. Even if you're intentionally exercising three or four times a week, if the rest of the time you're sitting at a desk and not doing anything or you're sitting on the couch, if your overall daily activity is low, you might still be technically considered sedentary if you sit a lot at a desk, et cetera. So Increase your daily energy movement, your daily movement, excuse me, as much as you can. Prioritize planned exercise sessions. All of this helps with that energy expenditure, but it also obviously, as we talked about, range of amazing benefits to your health um, as we age. So I think the empowerment comes from understanding that you actually have a a better ability to influence your metabolism through the choices that, that you make than you once thought. And even though it can be a little like jarring to hear hey, the age part is probably playing far less of a role than I've given it credit for. This is where shifting your mindset and your perspective a bit and realizing, hey, I have more control than I've once realized and what can I do to change that? Again, inside of Empowered Nourishment and Trust and Thrive Academy, I provide guidance on optimizing your daily activity levels as part, as I mentioned, as part of the Thriving Beyond 40 launch. You're going to be offered discounted uh, access to discounted programming, strength training programming, so you can decide Uh, what is best for you. And again, learn how to make more informed nutritional choices and just kind of having a better relationship with your movement. Number five, this one's a short one and we've already touched on it a bit. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. I heard that's me from Chris and JBX said there's actually some hope in that news. Great help. Good. I'm so glad to hear it. I think that's the thing. I think we can see it as, oh, woe is me. I thought that it was all my age and that's what was affecting my body. And there is some role the age may be causing us to be less active, which then by by a result, we are experiencing these changes. But it really is less to do with our metabolism changing as we age and more to do with our activities and our lifestyle. Number five, reasons why we're experiencing body changes after 40, shifts in our hunger and fullness signaling as we age. Our bodies possess a really intricate system for regulating our hunger and our fullness. These can experience fluctuations and alterations over time. And this obviously, as I'm sure you can understand, poses challenges in regulating our food intake and can lead to us potentially consuming more energy than our bodies require, especially if you are moving a lot less and you're craving and eating a lot more. Obviously, you can hear where that's going to potentially lead to changes in our body composition. Several factors contribute to this. Ding, ding, ding. Changes in our hormones, they play a pivotal role. That can impact the way our bodies signal hunger and fullness. These hormone shifts can create this kind of disconnect between our body's actual energy needs and our perception of them. So it's not uncommon to see increased hunger in perimenopause and menopause. In addition, going back to something I touched on earlier, the quality and the duration of our sleep can absolutely influence our hunger and our fullness cues. And if our sleep is dysregulated from any number of things, hormonal, uh, blood sugar related, etc., this disrupts that delicate balance, leading to imprecise signals that can affect our eating behaviors and our choices. Stress is a huge one. We all experience stress in our life. As we age, We have kind of heightened levels of stress in our life, but also we have a lower resilience to stress. Our body is less resilient. All of this can disturb hunger and fullness signals leading to emotional eating or just again consuming beyond what we need, beyond the energy needs our body has. The journey to maintaining a healthy relationship with food in our body begins, I think, with understanding this stuff. I think when we understand the role that our hormones play, that our sleep patterns play, that our stress levels play, I think this allows us to navigate these changes with much more intention and empowerment. And again, inside the, the both of the programs that I offer, the self-guided and the group coaching, I guide you through the strategies and I offer you the tools to address these factors. And I help you to understand 
how you can actually better tune into your body. We have an entire lesson on hunger and fullness cues and how you can better connect with the subtle cues you might be missing, maybe addressing the differences between emotional hunger or kind of emotional uh, cravings versus true physiological hunger and so much more. So when we focus on building mindfulness around our hunger and our fullness cues, when we work on fostering healthy, healthy, good quality sleep habits, um, all of this is going to better support our body and the changes. Um, and of course, just cultivating better stress resilience. All right, last but not least, number six, you know, I could not do an entire broadcast and not talk about mindset. This is crucial, and I've talked about it a bit already on tonight's call, and part of why I wanted to share and bust some of these common myths is to kind of push up against maybe some of these places in your life and in this journey where you have held a fixed mindset. I think this is a critical factor in all aspects of health and behavior change that often gets overlooked. As we explore kind of the the landscape of the body changes we experience beyond 40, We have to consider the lens through which we view this season of our life. Your perception of these changes matter. Do you see them as challenges that you are equipped to overcome? Are you embracing this phase with resilience and the belief that even though it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult, you have the tools and the means to navigate it? Or... Does the idea of these changes fill you with so much dread? Does it leave you feeling like a victim of your circumstances? Are the stress and the challenges so overwhelming that you're convinced you cannot do what it takes? If that's you, that sort of latter description, you may have a bit of a fixed mindset around this season of life. And I think that you have to recognize that your mindset holds tremendous power. It shapes your actions. It shapes your choices. And ultimately, I think this shapes your outcomes. Not, I think, I know. (laughs) So you have to embrace a growth mindset. A growth mindset encourages you to view challenges. Guess what? Post 40, (laughs) there are more challenges than we've maybe ever experienced with our body, with our nutrition, with our fitness, feeling like we're in a body that isn't ours, moving and joints and things just feel different. When you hold a growth mindset, you view these challenges as opportunities for growth and for learning. And it invites you to recognize that your abilities and your capacities, they're not fixed. They can be cultivated over time and you'll you'll get better with practice. And even though it may not be the most fun thing you do, you have what it takes to kind of get through this. Keeping an open mindset during this season of life, I think is key. I think it's just absolutely key. It allows you to approach all of the changes that you're experiencing with curiosity and compassion rather than fear with empowerment rather than defeat or that victim mindset. And I think acknowledging the the potential of this chapter to be one of growth and transformation, you open the door to discovering new ways to navigate the journey. So this number six, you're locked in a fixed mindset. I think this is hopefully the easiest one for you to change instantly. And again, one of the biggest things we cover inside of Empowered Nourishment, my self-guided program, as well as Trust and Thrive Academy, I guide you through cultivating a more positive and more growth-focused mindset. And inside of Trust and Thrive Academy, this uh, special edition launch, Thriving Beyond 40, each and every week of the eight weeks we have together, we are going to be specifically diving into the changes and the challenges of our mindset as women over 40. And we're gonna explore strategies to shift your perspective, to build resilience, and to just develop a healthy relationship with your body and your self-image. So as we wrap up this kind of exploration of these six, what I would say, what I would say, (laughs) what I would say are sort of the six most significant reasons behind body and weight changes over 40. I just want you to remember that you hold the power to shape your experience, that your mindset coupled with informed and intentional choices and practices can actually lead to a journey of empowered wellness and balanced living and that you're in the driver's seat. Last but not least, I just want to share with you and I open up the question box as usual for any questions that you have, but I want to just take a moment to remind you uh, and just share that if you want more accountability, more support, information and guidance and and implementation of all of this, 
I invite you to join us for the Trust and Thrive Academy Thriving Beyond 40 edition. We kick things off September 26th. You get lifetime access to the full eight-week coaching program, and it includes all of the live trainings and coaching calls, plus all of the videos, lessons, and modules, all of the downloads and resources, plus the two bonus modules. Um, You get to, if you'd like, choose an all-inclusive one-on-one option uh, where you'll receive a 60-minute one-on-one session with me at the start, including your very own personalized nutrition success roadmap path and action plan, including supplement and lifestyle recommendations. You get personalized nutrition and lifestyle assessment and analysis. And then there's also a group only option. So if you're looking for a further discounted rate, and then I have payment plans, op- payment plan options for all of these. You also get access to eight weeks of customized meal plans. They're fully tailored to your needs and your family's preferences. It's not a requirement. That's not how the work that I do operates. They're just simply an opportunity for inspiration and ideas to help you stay creative in the kitchen and just to make life easy as you establish new habits. And then through all of this, you get the option at any time to add on functional hormonal lab testing, additional one-on-one follow-ups. This includes things like the HTMA mineral testing, comprehensive blood panels, hormone and adrenal testing like the Dutch for both peri and postmenopausal hormones, as well as things like stool testing, etc. And then we also have a Trust and Thrive members only community forum and messaging on a dedicated app. And you can grab that app on any mobile device. You also get bonus access to my compassionate fat loss mini course if it's something you're interested in and lots of other goodies. I think I'm on the wrong slide where I I was sharing what you get. Um, And then as I mentioned, we're going to have an option this time around for discounted eight week progressive overload strength training program that will be suited to your needs. Um, And this is the specific programming I use. So as I wrap it up, I just want to let you know that early enrollment is open now. If you're on the wait list, you have been notified that doors officially opened for you for early enrollment. Otherwise, they're opening up on September 6th. So if you are catching this replay after that, just hit the link in the show notes below and you can immediately grab your spot. I'd love to answer any questions that you have about the things that we covered tonight, about your changing body, all of the things that you might be experiencing over 40. As always, I have various other coaching options available, including my self-guided nutrition foundations program and a limited amount of one-on-one spots available. So what can I answer for you about navigating body changes and any of the things you've been experiencing over 40? We covered a lot tonight. I hope it wasn't too overwhelming and I hope you're walking away feeling empowered and feeling like you learned something new and also just a better understanding of why your body's experiencing some of the changes that you're experiencing and maybe some of the things that you can do, hopefully with relative ease to make some changes if that's something you desire. So please feel free to use the chat. Um, I have a couple questions that came in, but I'd love to open it up to all of you joining me live. Someone shared um, on Instagram when I asked what questions, and I think this might be something to hear. Someone shared, I wish someone would have slapped me to get into shape in my 20s and 30s because the 40s are rough. And all I want to say to that, because I talk a lot and I have a lot to share about a lot of things, I'm going to keep this answer simple. And the simple answer is it is absolutely never too late to start. Is it going to be harder starting in your 40s than it was in your 20s? Sure but it's never too late to start. It's never too late to reap the benefits. People start lifting weights and introducing fitness and cardio in their 60s and 70s and beyond. You can do it if it's important to you and you recognize the role that it can play in your health and it aligns with your core values. Make it happen. I think that there's no there's no better time than now if it's something you're wanting to do. You're so welcome, Shoshone. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, one of the questions that came in is, and I don't know, again, if any of you experience this, but what to do about joint pain when it's likely perimenopause related. This we didn't touch on too much, but perimenopause and menopause can contribute to joint pain through various hormonal shifts and shifts in our body. One of the key factors is that decline in estrogen. There it is again. You're welcome, Carrie. Thanks for being here. Uh, this decline in estrogen levels that occur at this phase of life Uh, can impact our joint health because our estrogen promotes the production of our synovial fluid. And this is what helps to lubricate and cushion our joints. 
as our estrogen levels decrease, the production of that synovial fluid may decrease as well. And this can, for some individuals, lead to joint discomfort and stiffness. And a little fun fact, we'll keep it PG here, but a little fun fact is that this decline in estrogen is also why other things are less lubricated as well. Additionally, estrogen has anti-inflammatory effects on our body, so lower estrogen levels can result in increased inflammation. So this might also contribute to joint pain and discomfort. And again, this inflammatory response can, for some individuals, just impact overall function and their comfort of their joints. Of course, then body composition changes that might happen, all the things we talked about tonight, may also um, lead to a decrease in lean muscle mass, as we talked about. And this can also affect joint stability and support. Weaker muscles around our joints can potentially lead to greater stress in our joints, so that can contribute to pain. So what I will say is that if you want better joint mobility and lower overall inflammation, we first and foremost have to be eating in a way that supports lower inflammation. So again, we want to avoid blood sugar imbalances. We want to engage in regular exercise. I know that this can be challenging when you're already feeling pain. So I will say start light. You can do resistance training with just body weight and bands. I would recommend working with a coach or a trainer who can help you to modify Um Joint mobility will only increase as you strengthen the muscles around them. So being sedentary, I know it's easy when we're feeling pain, but being sedentary will only worsen many of the factors that lead to joint pain. So I would say if you're experiencing some of that, put a put an effort into some of the things you have control over and be okay with going slow um, and meeting your body where it's at. Oh, Annie, thank you. Annie shared... Uh, as a member of Trust and Thrive, I love having the knowledgeable and genuine support of Beth. Thanks, Annie. The app has an infinite amount of information and the answer to any question. Thanks, Annie. I appreciate that. Thanks for being here. I love seeing my my folks and my members over here in, in the lives. I love it. Any questions I can answer before we wrap up? I know, as I said, your brains, your little brains might be swirling around with loads of information. Hopefully it wasn't too overwhelming. Hopefully everybody has a little something that they can work on and put into practice uh, maybe over the next week. Maybe the next time we check in, I'll hear some things you're, you're feeling, some things that you're working on, some things you introduced, some new things you started. I appreciate all of you so much who are here, who share, who send in questions beforehand. It's so amazing for me to be able to connect with all of you. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment, share with folks who you think will enjoy it too. I'll see you next Wednesday for the next Balanced Wellness Wednesday with Beth. We've got some more good stuff coming. We're probably going to hang with this conversation around uh, what to do as I'm leading up to this new launch of Trust and Thrive Academy being uh, thriving beyond 40. We'll probably have more conversations around this. Uh, Jeremy said, thanks, Beth. A lot of helpful information presented in a clear and encouraging way. Always a good check-in for the middle of the week. Awesome. I love that. I love a good a, a good middle of the week reminder of Sometimes, sometimes we peter out around the Wednesday with the motivation and staying on task. So hopefully meeting you all here on Wednesdays is a reminder why you're taking so much time and space to take care of yourselves, to nourish yourselves, to move your bodies. All right, I'm going to go feed the pup, make myself dinner and crash on the couch. It is ungodly hot here today. I hope everybody's staying cool and enjoying the last few days and weeks of summer. I'll see you all next Wednesday. Thank you again for being here. And until next time, be well. Thanks, everyone.